I've been playing Riviera The Promised Land because you have no time to game. Riviera The Promised Land is a different JRPG. Originally developed by Sting Entertainment and published by Atlas, it was released for the PSP in 2005 in Japan and a bit later in North America and Europe. It's part of Sting Entertainment's Department of Heaven series, with other games like Idra Union and Knights of the Nightmare. It took me roughly 25 hours to complete. Set mostly in the land of Riviera, a world that's on the brink of destruction, players assume the role of Ayn, a grim angel, tasked with doing something for the gods. In this case, it might be destroying Riviera itself. But events unfold, and he becomes the protector, shall we say. Alongside his companions he makes along his journey, he'll uncover more truths about what's going on, about the gods, about demons, about sprites, everything. And as they traverse the land, they'll encounter powerful enemies, forge good friendships, and maybe just save something along the way. Riviera is an interesting story. I'm not sure it's the most complex out there, but there's a lot of it, and you get to really know the characters. So if you're into more character-driven stories, Riviera might be the one for you. Gameplay-wise, Riviera is a bit different. <laughs> I seem to be using that word a lot. It's kind of a combination of a standard JRPG, bit of visual novel thrown in there, and even almost like point-and-click adventure to create quite a unique mix. So let's start with the exploration. You don't walk around. There's no maps to run around in. You just have a screen with some options. You flick between the mode to move to the next area by a direction, up, down, left or right, or the like quest mode, which gives you an up, down, left or right options again, maybe, maybe all four, maybe one of them, which you'll then select to interact with something in that environment. And then something will happen. Usually a bit of conversation, a bit of description of the area, or maybe it's like a chest or some sort of item that's on the floor. It's uh, it's a bit odd. It took a little bit of understanding. So to actually interact with objects, you have to have TP, which is like a I never, I never grabbed the actual word for what the TP stands for. It's, it's a currency that you spend to interact with things. And uh, so you earn it through the combat system, which I'll explain a bit more in a bit. So you spend this TP to interact with stuff. In some cases, you have to interact with it multiple times, which, which like I said, reminiscent of point and click. You might need to do something several times. So, like, um, an example being there was one part where I had to dig the floor, like, five times to get a fancy item. Um, or you might see a chain, interact with the chain, and they, they'll be like, hey, guys, we can climb down that. And then you interact with it again. Yeah, yeah, we can definitely climb down that. And then when you switch back to the movement mode, where it becomes now an option that you can now climb down. It's, uh, yeah, it's it's all odd. <laughs> and like I said, it took me a bit of getting into. <laughs> but that's the, pe the best way I can think to describe it. Sometimes along with these, so especially with chests, you'll then get like a quick time event because some sort of trap has activated. There's several different types of quick time events. Some of them are like a mash a button or press a direction or whatever in a specific time, like a like rhythm mode. Um... At first, I really sucked at these, but by the end of the game, I was actually pretty good and barely ever failed them. And failure is it, it usually sucks because you'll lose a bit of health or whatever permanently, mind you. When when you fail these things, it's a permanent reduction. And you also, if you succeed in them, sometimes you get permanent increases. So it all balances out. <laughs> um, 
But yeah, but by the end of the game, I was pretty good at them and very rarely failed them. And you usually get the more, like, the rarer items from it. So, yeah, this, this leads us on. Sometimes when you move into areas, sometimes when you fail traps or even succeed at traps or, or interact with items, you can initiate combat. Um, combat's a turn-based affair. It's speed-based. So every character has, like, a agility stat and that affects when, when they get to go. And you just select an item. And that's your attack. Every character has got a different set of items that they're good at using. The items themselves have a like a, a usage amount, apart from one, Ayn's main weapon. That's an infinite usage. So you always have is uh, Ayn Harrier. So yeah, you, you can quickly run out of the uses of these items. To go along with it as well, as you hit the enemies, their rage fills up and your overskill fills up, which is kind of like, you know, your classic Final Fantasy limit break style thing. But the enemies have one as well. So you've got to kind of keep an eye out for how much you've hit them for when they're going to use their big attack on you. And then when this over, overdrive bar of your own is filled, you get to use your big attack with whichever weapon it is. Generally, I used Ein's Ein Harrier attack, but beware with that one because it breaks the bar for the that round of combat, so you can never do another one again uh, during that combat. <laughs> Some of the others, a lot of the others, you get to build up three bars, and they might use two or one or all three, but they don't break the bar like Ein's does. <laughs> um, but this this is when the next bit comes in. Um, using the items themselves is how you level up your character there's no levels as such it, it's a stat system that you just gain more stats it, with you when using weapons that the character is good at you'll see like a little experience bar and they've got to use that weapon a certain number of times um to then at the end of the combat where they filled it up they then get a stat boost. And they can now use that weapon's overdrive ability as well, or overskill, whatever it's called, ability. And there's a lot of times in the game where you'll you'll stop to kind of level your characters up again when you've got a bunch of new items. And especially with like the one item all four characters need to use it to level up, you're going to want to stop, get that sorted. This can be done via the practice mode. But once it's un once you unlock the practice mode, it's kind of like a fight old enemies, so you know you can beat them easily. You get to choose whichever characters you want in the battle and choose your items you want to level them up. Because at the start of every combat, I forgot to mention, you can only bring four items into combat with you. You also have limited inventory as well, so you're constantly managing what items you're carrying around with you. So it tends to make sense to quickly get rid of items you that will level your characters up but aren't of much use to you so in my case i find i was getting rid of a lot of the like buff items like give you a buff to your fire defense get them quickly level up with everyone ditch that item so i can have a weapon in its place so there's a lot of management around that and it unfortunately that bit does slow the game down a bit when you when you say you've got like five or six items and all the characters get leveled up by them. it's You tend to do the practice mode a lot <laughs> than to do it. So yeah, so we, we, we've explored, we've done the combat, and then at the end of the combat, you get graded. And depending on how high your grade is, which is how many turns you've done, how you finish the battle, etc. It gives you points. And this is where it recharges your... TP for exploration. So you want to do well in combat to be able to explore more. <laughs> um, you also get points for exploration as well for when you complete an area you get a grade and a score. Um, I didn't really care too much about the overall score. I, I cared about seeing the story and finishing the game. <laughs> um, 
I suppose one bit I missed about exploration is there are choices um, when when you're talking with characters you get to interact with them in different ways and this raises their affection or decreases their affection with, with Ayn which does affect the ending so there are a few the ending is similar but there are slight differences depending on who you raise affection with most um, so it's a, it's a classic raise affection with the girl you like the most <laughs> you, you know how it goes <laughs> Um, but yeah, that's most of the game. It's it's a bit weird. It feels traditional, but also really not at the same time. It's something that needs to be experienced. So as always, um, before I give my final wrap up, we have a look at Metacritic, and in this case, it's got a seventy six as of this video. Um, I doubt that will change much since it's such an old game. Um, it's also at a 7.4, so like a 74 from the user side, which honestly is about right, I'd say. I kind of agree with that. So yeah, in conclusion, Riviera of the Promised Land. It's, it's an interesting title to experience, and I feel like most JRPG fans should experience it once, because this is a style of game that could have been. Whether it should be, like... I don't think so. I think as a one-off, it's it's good for that. I'm glad they didn't make more games in this vein and stick to the more traditional <laughs> ways of playing that they work for me. This one wasn't 100% for me. But is that a bad thing? Is it a bad thing to experience new things? No. Like I said, it is worth trying it once. So my overall rating is give it a go.